This is a production of Cornell University. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ying, for your introduction and inviting me to share um, um, my, my work. And uh, I hope uh, this will be an opportunity to find uh, more mutual interests uh, um, um, with, uh, with the colleagues um, at, uh, at uh, Cornell. So as you see here today, my, um, my presentation title is Data Science of Human Environment Systems for Sustainable Development. Okay, so today, today's agenda, first, up, first I will briefly introduce my, the motivation and the framework of my research program. Then I will talk about two empirical components. One is pastoral systems or dryland system. The second is a global land rush. I will explain the terms later. And then towards the end, I will talk about future directions and uh, synergies. Um, all right, first of all, uh, motivation and uh, framework. So the big question in my, in my research program is to answer the question of how to achieve synergistic outcomes in human well-being and environmental sustainability in the context of a global development. And this question is largely aligned with um, many of the sustainable development goals, which represent a universal call to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that everyone lives in peace and prosperity. And my work is uh, largely uh, international, uh, with, uh, which rests on large collaborative uh, networks. So in Asia, uh, so I worked in, um, um, in West, primarily in Western China, in Xinjiang, um, the predominantly um, the ethnic re uh, region of China, like the, it's China's Muslim part, like with the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, they're studying the pastoral system there. And, um, uh, and also with Tibetan villagers um, to study the energy transition um, process uh, under the targeted poverty alleviation program of the central government. Then in Africa, mostly Ethiopia. Um, so for my, this is my PhD project. I went to Southern Ethiopia to study the dryland systems, how like a pastoralists, their livestock interact with uh, their rangelands. And uh, this is a, um, started from my postdoc project that started um, uh, land tenure change and its consequence on land cover change and uh, smallholder livelihoods at the local level. But later, I will also talk about uh, this topic at different uh, scales. And then in North America, like uh, when I was a graduate student here, um, um, I engaged with this um, um, uh, the farm worker program and uh, went to teach uh, English to to this uh, migrant. Uh, farm workers from Latin America. And uh, among that, my, those with the undergraduate students and uh, many of them like that I went to teach, like this, be, this, this graduate students who have interest in this, they typically speak very good Spanish. So soon after, after the five minutes, then the conversation switched into Spanish. And I, because I don't speak Spanish, so I, I think I fulfilled that goal of teaching English to the farm workers better than those undergraduate students. <laughs> But anyway, so that's my experience with that. And also in Phoenix, so like uh, we have some um, small projects with the Hispanic communities just um, on, urban guard, on urban community gardens for, for, uh, to enhance local food security and food access. So like, uh, as you can see here, so I, I conducted a work um, in many different parts of the world. That, therefore, I really echo is, um, at least in my field, there is a transition from international development to global development, right? Internet, we usually think of, oh, development is just out there. It's a question out there, but it is question, also a question right here, right? So that's why I really echo is this kind of transition and, uh, I'm, that, and I'm very excited to join a department called global development. So that's some of the background, then theoretical framework. So my, my research is largely involved formed by this kind of um, couple system um, approach, which is also uh, largely promoted by NSF as one of their um, very few regular interdisciplinary programs. And um, different terms have been used to, to, to name this system, right? Human environment, social ecological, coupled human natural. But at the core of those um, of this couple system is about the interactions, both within the natural and the human system and across those systems. But um, uh, like uh, moving that forward, like uh, I think uh, the, the recent frontiers of uh, studying socio-ecological systems is to 
analyze the joint outcomes, right? So when there's interactions, like what's the implications on human well-being and on, on environmental sustainability? In the context of uh, climate change, environmental degradation, or land tenure change, but I was at um, uh, but I would also highlight that actually the justice outcome of the, all those kind of in, uh, of uh, interactions is gaining more and more like um, attention and uh, 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 and the significance in uh, recent uh, scholarship. So I will also talk about later, like later in my talk, how this. Um, SDG, SDG 10 is considered in my, in my work. And then just one slide on the methods. So I use uh, um, data science and also a, a different um, like mixed methods to answer the question of um, on, on environmental sustainability, on how to achieve synergistic outcomes in human well-being and environmental sustainability and space, especially uh, many uh, spatial data science methods such as GPS, uh, GPS tracking, GIS, remote sensing and sound spatial cloud computing methods. And I also do qualitative work. I, I go to the communities and do participatory mapping interviews and focus group discussions with uh, smallholder farmers and herders to triangulate like the knowledge uh, we, we extract, uh, we, we get from this um, more quantitative methods. So um, first topic, um, trial and system sustainability, okay. So my interest in this topic started from my learning of the tragedy of the commons, all right, when I was um, starting here. Um, so according to Jim Harden, so ruin is the destination towards all man rush, each pursuing his, um, at time, only his. Um, so this is a direct quote, his own best interest in society that believed in the freedom of the commons. So you said like the pastoral system is a very classic example of uh, tragedy of the commons, right? Because every herder using that same patch of like um, pasture, anyone will have an interest to add more cows to the, to, the, to the system because the benefit is always greater than the cost, right? Benefit is one, cost is one over N, right? Shared by everyone. So like, why don't I keep doing that, right? So that's like, a, like a, that's Harden's argument. And um, looking at a photo like this, so people are more likely to like um, to be convinced by Hardin's argument, right? Because pastoralists they are irrational, and then that will eventually lead to uh, unsustainable pastoral system. So this is a picture I took uh, in my field work in southern Ethiopia, and um, I would say this is a little biased to capture the, what's going on in the system because as scholars we always go in the dry season. Because if you go in the wet season, your vehicle will get stuck in the mud and you, you don't want to call another vehicle to save you and then you go back in a month and, 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 and then save that so stuck vehicle, right? So, so it's, uh, it's, it's very biased. So I only return in the rain season once and the, the landscape looks totally different. Okay, I just want to highlight that. And uh, the solution to, um, to the tragedy of the commons is a large scale migration. So, this is in far northwestern west, far northwestern China. The Kazakh pastoralists migrate between the Gobi Desert and the uh, Altai Mountains that cover distance over, uh, in some cases, over 300 kilometers one way from the desert to the mountains. And uh, so this is a place like I, uh, throughout my talk, I will talk. Up, I will mention uh, like um, how like uh, my interaction with um, SIPs or at that time we call it CSS, right? I took many. Um, CSS courses, especially with uh, Professor uh, De Gloria, he 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 helped me a lot um, in those those kind of work. And uh, I still remember in my first semester here, I took his uh, uh, GIS class. And then the following semester, I took again took his class spatial modeling and analysis. I probably this is a map like I created like in his GIS lab. Sometimes I sneak in to the Bradfield lab because natural resources graduate student, at least me, some of them like including me were assigned to the chicken, chicken, the, the chicken house, F house, we call it. It's very hot in the, in the, in the humid when the temperature is, about, is around 30, uh, like um, centigrade. So that's why like, I, I like to use the, the facilities there. And uh, you see like, this is a, like a C, SDD edits, edits, right? He put the like, uh, give me some like feedback back in like 2011. So this morning as I was preparing for this, like, oh, Steve helped me like uh, when I was uh, preparing the field work, coming up with my ideas, right? And those are the two courses I took with uh, Steve and uh, 
Another one is uh, CSS um, 6900, uh, the scientific methods in practice, and uh, which is uh, co-taught by Gary. He is already emeritus now. But he said, in my class, I'm basically a TA for, for the author of this book, which is Hugh Gao. He wrote this book, and it, throughout the semester, it was him who was um, teaching this class. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really a, like, like a philosophical reflection of uh, scientific methods, which uh, inspired me a lot back then. So just a little story there. And then, OK, back to the topic. So large-scale migration as a solution, right? right? But pastoralism actually is, um, is the, is the, is the pref at least in the context of uh, far northwestern China, pastoralist, pastoralism is a preferred uh, livelihood strategy because if you just we lo look at the annual household income, right, it um, just dominates all other, it is just preferred, um, com it, it's higher compared to all other five um, uh, livelihood uh, like uh, strategies such as agro-pastoralist, crop farmer, smallholder, wage laborer, and the hired herder. But even, given, even if so, like the government, like their solution, right, um, in, Ch in the Chinese context is to sedentarize them. They construct these uh, uh, sedentarization villages um, and subsidize them, like sell them to these herders at a, very, at a lower cost as an incentive to convince them to move into those villages. And uh, when in our in our like uh, survey with those herders, we do see that uh, actually uh, most you see yes on unsettled households like uh, you will for the unsettled households the majority of them they do want to settle they want to move into the villages because they know doing this kind of a large scale migration is not easy especially in the context of uh, climate change environmental degradation but. Their experience uh, well, after they moved into the houses, you see this uh, peeling paint from the wall. The poor quality of those houses are of uh, critical concern. And this is just one example. And finding viable livelihood uh, like in those uh, sedentarized villages is also very hard for them because um, many of them, they do not, do, not, do not have the skills to transition into non-pastoral livelihood strategies. So therefore, the gap between the synergy state, like food security and the environmental sustainability, right, with the, real, with the reality, which is a trade-off, right, either compromise environment for food or compromise food for environment, right, motivates me to, like, uh, like uh, I, I think it's important to address this gap. But um, what's more, like, uh, we, what, what's worse on the ground is, uh, is a is a lose lose a scenario where we see like for example in Xinjiang people the herders they struggle with their livelihoods in degrading environments right so closing this gap becomes a fundamental goal in my research so then after like I did my master work in in Xinjiang then I went to southern Ethiopia to do to do more work and. Um, so these are the five, uh, five of our study sites um, in the Borana zone of Ethiopia, which is uh, just uh, north of, uh, north of uh, Kenya. So again, for my PhD project, I received even more um, support from um, SIPS faculty, especially from Steve. Like at the first, I remember, I, when I started my PhD, I asked him, oh, Steve, can you serve on my um, graduate committee, PhD committee? And he was like, oh, I'm going to retire. So, but now when I finished, he still hasn't retired. You're retired. He said he was in a phase of retirement, but um, I don't remember exactly when he retired, but he was still here. But anyway, so you see some of his last, last uh, most of, like recent publications, like before he retired was uh, with me. So I'm happy to see that. And, um, and he, uh, um, later, he, he actually um, like um, applied for funding to support the GPS tracking of the cows uh, in Southern Ethiopia. So that's, that's support by Steve. And also I took two um, classes um, in SIP, so one by uh, Tom Sylvia and uh, Carl Nicholas. And that class was in this classroom. I still remember Professor Nicholas, he was doing this. So he drove like a flower structure, like with two hands, something like that, making it very hard for me to like to keep up with his pace because he used two hands to draw like, a, like a, those, uh, those structures, right? But it's it's really amazing to see how he he like uh, do these kind of things. And another class I took was um, with uh, Melissa Luco on the taxonomy. I took those class because um, because I I wanted to um, identify the scientific name 
of um, plants in Ethiopia in my study area. So quite it's it's quite a, like a, a challenge for me to to take those and and then do the field field work and uh, bring the 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 plant specimens to the national barium of uh, Ethiopia and do the and identify the scientific uh, name. That took quite a long time, especially for someone like who had didn't have uh, much training before then on this topic. So the research question about achieving synergies, which is up, uh, right? In that context, synergy means livestock production and the rangeland sustainability. We need to have both methods. This is a, uh, well, I would say this is one of the novel um, approach we we've ever we 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 did in that in that project is uh, the GPS tracking, right? So Steve uh, was um, a major um, PI in this uh, effort. So we. Um, this is uh, our collaborator based in Boise, Idaho. He's a range scientist. He designed those GPS collars um, and uh, shipped them to Ethiopia, and uh, we also put them together and um, um, deployed them on the cows. In total, we did uh, uh, we put uh, GPS collars on 60 cows um, um, in five study sites for four years. Every five minutes, we got a uh, like a uh, coordinate like update. So that means over millions of uh, points, right? That has spatial and temporal information. And in addition to that, we did a map mapping with herders and um, Magdalene, um, she helped me with, um, with uh, preparing those maps. So lots of support um, from, from CSS um, um, faculty back then. And, uh, and then we also did a plant survey to, to, to study the rangeland the vegetation. So now some results. <laughs> So um, for this one, so we see on the rangeland side, so I'm just using one slide to summarize. What we see is like moderate grazing pressure contributes to uh, rangeland sustainability in, in the sense that it has the dense herbaceous cover, but a sparse woody plant cover. But when the grazing pressure is too low, the system tends to shift into this kind of dense thickets, right? And the cattle will have a hard time to access the herbaceous um, resources in the understory. But when the pressure is too high, right, the system tends to shift it in, in, into this uh, um, bushland, right? Very little herbaceous stuff for cattle grazing, only those kind of acacia shrubs. And the, on the other hand, the other um, synergistic goal is livestock production. So, right, when we think, think of our livestock production outcomes, you will think about the body conditions of uh, those cows, right? Not good good, like the thin ones and fat ones. Those are some, from the herder's pers perspective, they will think like that. But of course we didn't measure their body weight change over time. Like, but with GPS tracking, that can shed light um, on this uh, livestock production outcomes, right? So I'm just here, here putting two cows uh, temporal dynamics of their behavior. So the top one you see spend a lot of time, effort on traveling. That means fast, fast moving from um, in the in the morning and afternoon, late afternoon, to rush between the camp location, their their base camp, to this major grazing sites, go there fast, and then come back, right? But during the day, they have uh, they will have opportunities to to graze. But this one below is a belongs to the the owner is a uh, mobile herder, right? That means he relocates his cow to different locations in the dry season. So so yeah. During the time of camp, during the day of a camp relocation, you do work a long distance. But once you relocate to a seasonal grazing resource, then you basically the cow wake up and they start to graze. So they minimize they can minimize the traveling um, behavior, um, like uh, uh, throughout the season. And if we link those temporal dynamics of a cattle behavior to their spatial utilization pattern, we will see that right the, the one owned by a uh, sedentarized herder, right? This is a base camp location. And uh, as it gets drier, the cow needs to walk longer distance. Or towards the other side, this is the in the mountains, right? That means the cow cattle need to even climb up the hill to access the, the resources. But on the right side, camp for location, right? Really help with the minimizing traveling behavior. This is the base camp location. In the West season, the cow is based somewhere here. Right, and then as the dry season comes, the cow is relocated to different patch of uh, range of resources. So we, that's why we see this. So the, 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 the take home message here is that spatial resource access is key, is crucial 
to achieve synergistic outcomes in that, at least in that context. So the next question is, um, what are the determinants of our spatial resource access? So here I'm going back to Ostrom theory on like um, second tier variables in the framework for analyzing a social ecological system. So of course, obviously I didn't have um, like data for all the variables that she identified, but, um, but she said in the paper, it's okay, especially, um, um, so you, you just uh, get um, like as many uh, variables as possible, right? So for me, I got like, in the, it's a pasture system and the size of a resource, resource system, I use the herding extent as a, as a, to measure this and the productivity um, using, uh, using vegetation index. And uh, for users, we have a community, num number of households in the community and location, we use distance uh, to roads as a measurement. And the outcome here is the synergistic outcome achieved by camper location. Right. So here I'm skipping like the, the big regression tables and just to show you the, the significant results, right? The, all those um, predictors have a significant uh, um, uh, effect on this outcome, right? Including her. So, so but I will just uh, explain more um, you, in, in, in here. So the implications. So first, what we find is the extensive movement is a, is a, is a key adaptation to environmental stress. That means uh, um, right. That means that this is this is the one big, big um, from this vegetation index. Uh, the, as the vegetation index goes lower, pastoralists are more likely to do camp prelocation. Right. It, this means it's a clear adaptation to um, environmental stress and um, policy implication is that camp prelocation should uh, should be recognized as a as a key strategy to ensure seasonal access choose forage resources in, in future pastoral system, um, um, policy making instead of encouraging this kind of sedentarization policy. So here I didn't mention this like same in, as in China, the Ethiopian government is also um, encouraging sedentarization. Um, they, they didn't have the, like the resources of the Chinese government to subsidize uh, the construction of uh, sedentarization villages, but they give um, land to people as an incentive, say, hey, if you're sedentarized in this village, you can enclose this much of land and that's your private land for crop cultivation, right? They are trying to give incentives to, to encourage certain behaviors. And second is um, related to the resource herding extent here. So of course, right, a larger herding extent can facilitate uh, extensive movement, but in this part of the world, the pastoralist, um, the, given the increasing population, livestock and the human population, um, it's the herding extent is shrinking. So one potential solution to this is um, to facilitate inter-community land sharing, to facilitate large scale movements and the spatial temporal redistribution of resources, right, on, on a reciprocal basis. And the third is that it's about group size effect. A smaller group size in a community facilitates extensive movement. So this means that the, trans, um, the effect of group size on the transaction cost of, um, of um, extensive uh, movement is negative. And uh, this means that in the future policy making, we need to facilitate a fair procedure and participation in reducing the high cost of uh, agreeing on rules to coordinate this. Um, uh, resource sharing, camp location. And this is, you can see, this, there is a conjunction in the access to water. This is a borehole, like pumped water from, uh, um, to, to water the cow. Especially in the dry season, it's necessary to water the cow at least every three days. Otherwise, they'll be in trouble. So in addition to this kind of a GPS tracking a related uh, research, right, we also studied, uh, I also studied uh, traditional ecological knowledge, like, um, basically to study the, uh, the palatability of different forage species to four major livestock species in that um, part of the world, goat, camel, sheep, and cattle, right? So either herbaceous or woody or the palatability level. So this is the hard part, right? Why I'm preparing, I, I did took those plant science um, class because I wanna, I wanna do this. So collect like um, the plant spe like, uh, specimens, right? and bring them to the National Barium of Ethiopia. Uh, meanwhile, when we collect each uh, specimen, we ask the herders the, the, their palatability level to the, the livestock species. And based on their, um, based on their like, um, description and also their perception of their 
either increasing or decreasing in their availability, right? We simulate that um, the, 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 the plant palatability change uh, uh, over time as more herbaceous plants are being replaced by woody plants. And we do see that right, for, cat, for cattle is black. Cattle and sheep, they, they will suffer a, de, a, a declining average of um, palatability. Goats will stay more or less the same, and camels will, 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 will have a we have a positive change in palatability over time. So actually those, as we can see here, the herders are already adapting their livestock portfolio according to their understanding of, um, of um, their, the plant dynamics change in, in, on the rangelands. And actually I would say this is, a, this is a, not a small deal because um, cattle has very important cultural like significance in that part of the world, the entire, like the, the herding, like the community, the Boran culture is built on cattle. Now, you, if you're asking them to change in, um, in their livestock species, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big change in their, in, not just in their choice of livelihoods and the herding strategy, but also cultural change. But encouragingly, right, we do see that um, um, there is a change in livestock portfolio, like especially, um, uh, for both rich and poor households, there is a reduction in cattle with holdings, and uh, also for um, but for for goats, we see that both groups there is an increase in the holding of goats, and for wealthier households, they they are able to uh, increase their camel uh, holdings, and also community engagement. Right, this is also very important. So I created those. Um, you with this GPS tracking data, I created those uh, maps and uh, translated them into the local language, Afan Oromon, with my the help of my local collaborators and print those and given those back, uh, give gave these maps back to the community. So hopefully, those maps will serve as a tools to help them, um, um, help them um, reflect their resource use patterns and uh, and uh, defend their land tenure from potential land grabbing. Right, because they're encroaching interest from agribusiness on those lands. So speaking of uh, land grabbing, leads to the second topic. I'm not sure, like we, we have time until 1.15. Okay, I'll go a little faster now. Okay, 1.15 is four questions or just me? Okay, okay, okay. Global land rush, the second empirical component. and. So what I mean by, so here, when we, global land rush is a term that's used by like, um, me, like uh, media or like um, some scholars, but here we are using the term um, uh, large scale land transactions to refer to the topic. So like land rush means that it's, uh, it has some um, negative connotations and um, even like even worse terms could be like land grab, right? That, that is like uh, focusing on the role of investors, like. Uh, Go into the communities and get land. Um, so here we use the term transactions because we believe it's more neutral. So this means land deals made between investors and host country governments in the form of um, concessions, long-term leases, and ownership transfers for agriculture production. This is what we are we focus on here. So this is on the left is a photo that I took on the ground. In a, so what is this crop? Can can anyone? This is easy. Sugarcane, right? It's a large sugarcane plantation. So I was probably somewhere here taking the photo. So you see this large sugarcane plantation starts in like contrast with uh, the neighboring small parcels of a uh, small smallholder taff or maize patches of um, smallholder farms. So this is um, a farm that's built like by aggregating smallholder farm lands together, um, do irrigation and uh, um, I bring water into this area and then and then start the sugar cane plantation. So that's just one form of uh, land tenure change, right? There are different forms like changing from like forests like uh, or community forests or like rangelands into this kind of uh, large scale agriculture. So if we look at this phenomenon globally, right? The global food regime in, actually in transition, we see like um, major investor countries go into um, uh, to the global south, right? To, to look for land for agriculture development. And uh, if we just um, 
use a, a, a network approach to understand what's going on. We do see that uh, both the US and China, they are the two most important uh, land investors in the global land transaction market, right? Indicated by the size, bigger the size, the more important, that means the higher, like the more, the greater amount of land transactions and the, the, the location, right? In this network means that centrality, right? They play central roles in this global land rush. So sometimes, like I see start, um, like in, they, they blame China for this, but US is doing the same, right? So in, at least this is what um, the data reveals from this uh, uh, land matrix data set that's open access. So motivation, why do people wanna do that, right? So what's plantational thing? So this is a paper by my colleague in global development. Um, so Wendy, she argued that plantation has been promoted globally as a social system and imperative and a mentality, right? So in plain words, right, investors want to convert this kind of a, they call underutilized forests or rangelands into all this smallholder farm, pl farm plots into this plantations and uh, large scale farms, right? To, and also the local government also have a, has an incentive to facilitate this because this will generate less, this is the mango plantation, right? Intended for, for export. So that will generate like um, uh, foreign currency for their, for, their, for their government. That's very important um, for them. And why this is a global concern, I would say three major reasons. One is large extent areas, right? somewhere between 40 to 120 million hectares of land. Even the lower end is greater than the size of Germany. And uh, social economic inequality, as, um, as in indicated here, right? Um, agribusiness investors competing with local people for land use. And the environmental injustice, like deforestation um, and, uh, and the carbon emission associated with uh, this land cover change process. So insufficient, why there, so when we, uh, our team started to um, study this issue, right? We did a, system, uh, a comprehensive literature review and we find the three major knowledge gaps in this topic. One is lack of data because the land, 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 land transactions um, um, is very secretive. Right, it's a government and local investor and the investors make a deal. Usually they don't publicize. So the, for scholars, it's very hard to access like those data in a systematic way. And uh, size selection bias, those who are like caught uh, media headlines, they are more likely like uh, to receive scholarly attention, right? And also pre-integration of um, outcomes. Here's what I mean, like most, most um, scholars, uh, academic research on this topic focus on the social aspects and some on the ecological environment. So, but um, there is a lack of integration of um, socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. So that's why like when we started to study this topic, right? We need to, we, 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 we decide to focus on the joint outcomes when we analyze this and uh, with attention to the social inequality and environmental injustice issue associated with the land, land tenure change. So I studied this at different uh, scales, right? At the local level. So we, we answered the question of um, how changes in control over land and resources affect the men and women's labor allocation, livelihoods and well-being. So when, when we were in the communities, we do see like uh, men and women we were treated differently, right? Both of them work on the farms, but women have to take a plow, carry the plow by themselves and walk to their assigned farm plots to work. But men, at least they will have a tractor to transport them from the village to the farm plots. That's what we observe and, uh, at first. And then we hold a different uh, uh, like uh, our focus group discussions with, a diff uh, with uh, male and female groups to understand this. So here, I'm not going to talk about the details, but just to give a sense of like uh, at different scales, we answer different questions. And the national level, so we answer the question of uh, does land uh, transaction accelerate deforestation, right? The important thing is um, accelerate because um, even if uh, like a uh, land transactions doesn't happen in those areas, uh, the growing rural population in the developing world is also de uh, may also um, cut down forests to, to grow more food, right? So the point is like um, using an econ uh, econometric approach like to, to come to, to to do causal inference on whether land transactions accelerate uh, deforestation. So here we focus on four countries, Ethiopia, 
um, Liberia, Peru, and uh, Cambodia, where we can get uh, land transaction boundary data, the polygons, right? So uh, as I said, this is a very hard to get this kind of data because of secrecy of those deals. And the global level, we study the drivers and impacts of our land transactions. So for this one, I'm going to into a little bit more details. So first global, um, so this is the data source that I mentioned to generate the, um, the, the network, right? That I mentioned earlier, it's from this, uh, it's an open source um, data set called the land matrix. At that time, when I did the research, it's like about 2016, 17, right? There are about 1,500 1, land transactions globally, like yeah, as you can see the distribution here. So with this data set, we want to, we, we first analyze the drivers of this global land rush by looking, by comparing um, um, the characteristics of uh, uh, investor and uh, host countries of land transactions, right? According to like uh, per capita income, agricultural productivity, um, arable land availability and the water scarcity, right? Across those four um, dimensions, we do see there is a flow of like a virtual flow of land Right from wealthier, from less wealthier, wealthy countries to to more de developed countries. Right, as you see, low income countries they indeed predominantly serve as a as a supplier of land in the global land rush. So because of time, I'm not going to all the details in the other three. But what is the more important question is, right, the consequence of this. Like uh, there are many studies on deforestation, but so that's why I'm I think. Um, but uh, carbon emissions from this um, process hadn't been uh, studied that much. So, um, so that's, um, we see uh, our, our, our uh, potential contribution. So, and uh, we only studied the issue at emissions um, at the land conversion stage, right? So it's a long um, supply chain and it can uh, have, um, have, um, have, um, like a more carbon is gen generated from this process. But uh, here, this is just a represents a starting point, you know, which is like uh, from land, land use conversion. This is what I took in Western Ethiopia, the photo. So it shows like this newly cleared forest to grow soybeans in Ethiopia. You see the cleared like uh, woodlands it yet to be like um, burned, right? And then you see those uh, soybean ceilings in the, on those lands. And there are two major sources of um, emissions, right? At this stage, biomass and the soil organic carbon. So those are, there are some um, uh, globally available data sets that we use to, for this estimation. Although biomass carbon, right, once you clear, they are all lost, but soil organic carbon loss is a different story. So we refer to the literature. I mean, this is just uh, the average number, right? Because at different locations, it's, um, the, the, the percentage of loss is different, so, right? From forest to cropland, 42% loss. Pasture to, to crop, 40, 95. And crop to crop, like smallholder crop to large scale crop, right? 0% um, loss. So with that kind of variation taken into consideration, then we need to think about, right? When we change, what's the starting point, land cover, and what's the ending point? Land cover. Uh, ending point, it's clear, it's, it's cropland, right? But starting point, we need to, so here we use um, the 2001 MODIS land cover um, um, global uh, data set um, to, to do this land use classification using Google Earth Engine and master uh, water, permanent wetlands, urban and uh, non-vegetated lands because land transactions are unlikely to happen, right? In those areas, so we need to exclude them. Probably, now, in, in retrospect, we should we can exclude more areas like such as by considering the slope or some some other environmental covariates. But um, this is just, as I said, it's just representing a, like a first uh, step to answer this question. <laughs> so then we need to consider about the implementation strategy, right? The first is the business as usual, right? As an investor, you would clear all the lands to maximize your, your economic return, right? Convert this, this is in central Ethiopia. This is a sort of a typical savanna landscape. You see there's a tiny like tree canopies, sparse tree canopies being come, but then after implementation, they are all cleared to establish these large scale farms, right? Right, as an investor, you would, um, you would do this. And then this means um, for forest pasture and whatever landscape, um, the prior landscape is you convert all of them into cropland and then based on this um, 
uh, scenario, we calculated the total transaction area, biomass carbon loss, and the soil organic soil carbon loss. But what's um, the next uh, strategy is uh, what we propose um, as that can be used as a policy tool to, to, to how do you say, to reduce carbon emission from this process, basically to enforce environmental regulations to protect forests. But then this is, um, this is uh, like, uh, then the question, the challenge here is what kind of environmental um, like uh, regulations and how such regulations can be enforced on the ground throughout the, um, like the uh, global tropics. That's a challenge, right? Even if in Ethiopia, let's say the central government say, you need to retain at least 20% of um, natural vegetation on the landscape. But when it comes to ground implementation, it can be very different across different regions. So that's why what we did is like to apply the first administrative unit level deforestation rate in the past 15 years as the level that can be enforced on the ground to determine the level of the enforcement that we can do like globally, right? As you can see here, uh, on the right side, we do see some natural vegetation that is uh, being retained, retained on this um, land transaction side. At least this is better than clear cutting all the natural vegetation, right? So then this diagram shows, shows uh, the before and after. So that means like we, for the forest, we retain whatever level that can be enforced on the ground and let's see how like how much carbon emission that we can we can reduce then then again we use a google earth engine to uh, determine the tree cover loss percentage and the forest cover percentage loss also for the technical parts i'm not going to the details and uh, just a little bit more here this is uh, shows the the main results right it's about synergy uh, it's in this case it's not necessarily about the synergy but it's more about uh, managing the trade-offs between emissions and agricultural production. As we can see here, so if we change from business as usual to regulated scenario um, with some um, like meaning uh, enforcing environment, uh, forest protection policies, then biomass emission can be reduced to about 15% of the BAU scenario and um, soil organic carbon loss can be reduced to about 40%. But um, at the same time, nearly 60% of transacted land can still be implemented for agriculture production, right? So this is a, um, this means like um, the, um, if um, um, we need to recognize um, both goals, carbon emission uh, and also food security, especially in Africa with growing population, we do need to produce more food. The, the question here is where? Do we like decide that we can let this kind of um, um, capital-driven um, agricultural development to happen, and uh, at the same time we save those high carbon value forests, right? That's um, the main message. So I will just spend the last uh, two minutes to briefly uh, go to, um, talk about the future directions, right? One is built on the first, my first topic that I talked about is the just transitions in the drylands. Right, as the system transition from this into more like um, crop, like um, ag more like a um, cropping system from this uh, uh, herding to, to cropping, then how can those um, herders, like uh, local people, adapt to those changes? And the second is about land, land system change and global health in, uh, inequality, basically focus on the, um, by, to study the drivers of land system change and two major mechanisms, zoonosis, which are zoonosis spillover and the food insecurity and it's a global health inequality. And uh, actually I was started to explore a little bit of those uh, to, to, to understand agricultural development and its consequence on zoonosis spillover, right? because uh, existing research has already shown that uh, major zoonotic disease host species such as uh, passerine birds, bats, and rodents, uh, they're more likely to uh, thrive at this interface between natural and uh, human dominated uh, systems. So, so that's why like land transactions like uh, as a driver of this will we'll, we'll certainly increase this boundary between those. So, as, um, so at the first step, we are mapping these uh, global hotspots of uh, zoonosis spillovers because of land transactions. New topics that I just uh, started to explore 
in my first two months um, I call, um, back here is that like, one is a circular about nutrient economy for agro-system transition. Um, um, when the, we have a proposal right now re reviewed by uh, USDA NIFA. And another potential project is um, rice farm. Rice farming on seasonally uh, flooded lands as adaptation to climate change in uh, New York State, right? So as because of climate change, more lands in, in, in here, they have been seasonally flooded. If we can do rice farming on those, um, um, on those lands, right? It will, come, it will turn those kind of, um, how, how to say, those disasters into product, production opportunities, right? So yeah, again, this is an example of um, global development, right? It's not just about what's going on in Africa, but also here in New York State. So that's it for my talk today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah unfortunately not yet. That was my last trip to those communities. I really hope like uh, we can raise some funds and go back to the communities and see whether those information have an impact, have any effect on their resource user patterns, right? That's, that, that's my hope, but I, I really wanna see whether that's, that's having any effect in those communities. Actually, they say, the, the cost of, um, of making this map is more expensive than a goat. They, that my local collaborators, they will say, why don't you give them a goat? They will be happier than receiving this kind of um, a piece of map. I said, um, this is what I can do. Like, uh, but, 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 you know, it's, um, the, the mentality is very different. But I, that's what I hope. But uh, when, in my, like, uh, at the, when I, give this map back to the communities we discuss, right? Some of the, the younger people, they, they can, they can read those maps and, and say, oh, this is a, a well that I go to in the dry season. That's a, the, our community school, you know. They, they are very good at us, like a spatial orientation, those are pastoralist communities. So I do hope that uh, this can have some effect. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good suggestion that maybe we can raise <laughs> funds, like seed funds from, or somewhere to revisit those communities. I'm not sure. Like actually, you can you can ask Ying. She is uh, working with Chris on um, those projects, and uh, this is um one. Actually, it's one of uh, Chris's. Uh, pro he's a PI on this. I, I need to ask him this question. Actually, if uh, there is any continuation of um, of of in in this line of thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I didn't show um, some of the maps that are of the land sharing. It's like community from like these are um, at least 50 kilometers away from each other. Sometimes they are like we see evidence of one community going to the other to share land with the others. So they are already doing this kind of land sharing on a reciprocal basis. Yeah, it's the, the, the exerting extent is shrinking for all communities, but uh, this kind of uh, institutions to facilitate that kind of land sharing, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's very crucial for them to, to, to keep like to maintain a, a relatively high level of uh, mobility. I'm not sure if that's your question or, oh, uh, yeah, I, I do think so, right? Because um, at least um, they can minimize the walking, right? That reduces like a, a stress for the cows, right? Um, you um. In, in their in their daily grazing like um, activity, right? Exactly. So yeah. Thanks. So will I or, or you? Sure. Yeah. There is a big literature like uh, on on those topics. So from the investors' perspective, and also from more from this local people's perspective. Based on my like uh, interaction with the local people, they are more than happy to get more involved because, um, because that means higher return for them. But once you establish this large scale farm, that means less demand for labor, higher mechanization, right? Those people basically for, at least, let's, let me just use this example. For this one, what they received is a share according to, share of the revenue according to their land contribution to this uh, sugarcane plantation. Then, then that basically frees free up the labor in the, within the household, then they can go to the nearby towns and the cities to serve as uh, wage laborers. And also all work in the Chinese factory. Like uh, there is a Chinese economic zone uh, just nearby. They just go to make shoes in the company and uh, earn a wage. So actually local people are more than happy to do that 
I, 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 I wouldn't say all, all of them, but some of them, they are happy to do that. But the thing is lack of opportunities, like, um, um, like, um, like um, the Chinese economic zone. If there are more of those, like um, that can provide uh, employment opportunity, especially for the young people in Africa. I think this um, actually, um, this will work out even better. But then, but, well, but actually one of the major concern is like, once you do this, what happens to the local people? They lose land, they lose means of livelihoods. They at best get a share of the revenue from the sugarcane plantation. That's the best they can expect. Because um, those, they, they don't want to hire local people. And this is in central Ethiopia in the agriculture. But if you go to the pastoral regions or in, in the sort of the periphery of Ethiopia, then those local people have very little skills of farming and the investors are very unwilling to train those people and then have them farm, like work, do farming work on their, on their, on their farm. So, so we do see those kind, it depends, really depends on where. In this part of Ethiopia, I think it, it may work. It may lead to better outcomes compared to others. That's why it leads to a lot of uh, in, in confrontation between the investors and local people. Even the people can burn their sugarcane plantation or sabotage their, their tractors or that, something like that. That happened. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.